Cool. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Right. The conference looks amazing right now. There's a lot of people. Um, I'm going to try to make this as exciting as possible. I know engineering kind of gets a bit boring, but <laughs> I want to make this a bit interesting. So there will be some interactive parts to it, but try to hold your questions till the end. Um, I'll just go through some use cases and make this kind of simple. So we're going to be talking about how to migrate from your old full stack environment and try to go to something a bit more serverless. Right, and how you can actually build out these microservices using uh, cloud providers that have AWS Lambda, PubNub functions, Azure functions. So my name is Slade. John <laughs> introduced me earlier. I'm a developer relations engineer at PubNub. The goal for me is to make it so that you can stop spending time kind of just smashing the keyboard and trying to get things to work and spend more time making that money. <laughs> so here's kind of the agenda for today. First. I want to go through the challenges for fintech. I want to try to identify the real things that are, that are addressing this industry, and then find out the real world solutions for, for what you can do. And then also we can go into how to implement these functions and put into a real world use case. So let's first actually define serverless, because you always have to do that for a serverless talk. Um, the idea is that it's a completely managed infrastructure. We should be able to abstract away the infrastructure from the code and be able to use this across the globe. It should be scalable and limitless in terms of scalability. But I like to divide it up into three main things. First, you should be able to connect all the devices that you want to be on the network. Next, you should be able to deliver data across those devices, regardless of what the device is. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, I, <laughs> okay. So you should be able to deliver, device, deliver data across these devices, regardless of the device. So if it's an Android, iOS, um, desktop, you should be able to deliver those pieces of data to those devices. And then the key thing is be able to control that data. What's the point of sending data if you can't either alter it in transit or be able to alter it through an API? So that means either having an AWS Lambda function or some sort of function that can take this data, alter it, and return some sort of data back. So let's actually start off by understanding how this kind of all started. So from 2014 beyond, like when the iPhone 6 came out, iPhone 5C, we saw mass adoption with smartphones. And this kind of led us to kind of re this led us to kind of rethink the way that we build out applications. We want to start aiming for mobile first. So that means that we want to be able to have a lightweight application that can scale to Android, iOS, and websites. So that, that meant then that we took our traditional application that looked kind of like this, a monolithic architecture where we had our user interface, our business logic, and our data access layer all on one website. And we kind of went a bit into this. And that's kind of why you guys are here, to understand microservices, right? We took our user interface and we took it out of, it. We took it out of the guts. And we said, OK, we want to separate our business logic because we know that this needs to scale. Then we took our databases and found a way to replicate them so that when there's a lot of people, like for example, using Grab or Gojek, and there's a lot of people on board, we want to be able to scale each individual part. So let's say, for example, a lot of people are using payments at a certain point. We want to scale up our payments microservice so that we can address that problem. So then we, caught, we, we came onto another problem, and that was being able to make real-time experiences for every user. And that, that really meant that, okay, let's say you open up the Uber app, and we want to be able to see the cars real time. And this is kind of a trend that started with mobile users. We saw that we want to be able to see these real time analytics from our servers and be able to act on it in real time as well. Imagine a time, let's say 2008 to 2012, can you think of anything that really had real time? Only the big companies did, but recently we saw these uh, late to market consumer apps like Uber that were able to do it themselves. <clears throat> So we actually had this old paradigm of doing things, and that was being able to have uh, an API endpoint and making an HTTP request to that API endpoint. And that was all great, right? You have a simple piece of data. You want to make a request, get a JSON back, and put that into your front end. That's perfect. But when we have these real-time applications where you need to have that constant one-to-one -one connection to stream data, this really just doesn't cut it. It doesn't scale. And that's where we kind of thought of these wacky ideas of HTTP long polling and having these polling methods where what we would do is every interval defined by the developer, oh, every three seconds, I'm going to ping my server for some sort of data. This just didn't scale well. So the classic HTTP polling method where 
you'd send a request, receive a response, and then have an indefinite connection until there's an update on the data. This didn't work when you had multiple connections, like let's say 1,000 connections on the same server. And let's say we address that problem. Let's say after all that, we were able to get HTTP long pulling working. We got um, you know, light, lightweight mobile applications. The other thing was, how are we going to be able to have uninterrupted service at a large scale? Because the moment something goes down, even for two minutes, and we, we experienced with, jo with Gojek last year, where they went down for two minutes and they lost a lot of business. So how are we going to be able to do this where you have even a million users, two million users, 10 million users, and it doesn't matter? So this method, it just doesn't work. And that's where services like PubNub, AWS, and other cloud providers come in. They manage the infrastructure for you. So you're focusing on the business application rather than building out infrastructure. <clears throat> so this whole confusing diagram where you need to find a way to make a Kafka cluster, cluster then send that through Spark streaming and process all this data, you don't really need to do that anymore. It's actually much cheaper to just use a, a cloud provider to do all this for you. So let's look at some real world use cases. <clears throat> so does anyone know about StockX by any chance? No? So there's this, <laughs> there's this trend in the US where people are selling, reselling things like Yeezys and uh, really expensive clothing online and StockX is the largest marketplace of things. So if I wanted to sell, let's say, my Prada bag, I go on StockX, I list it, and similar-minded people will bid on that item. And you might not really realize it, but with StockX, something that's really important, important is the ability to bid on things real time, right? Let's say, for example, you have a high-ticket item like the one they have up here, the Cavs Championship Court Pack, where some Cavalier merchandise is being sold. You're going to have people bidding in real time, and if you're not able to tell oh, if my bid is at the top or if it's at the bottom, how do you know if you're going to be able to purchase it or not? And this website currently has about 2 million users like actively bidding on it, and they have an index to uh, show the prices of, let's say, Nike, the overall stock price and the merchandise going through their platform. So what if they built it themselves, right? Like, what if they took the time to not focus on their product but focus on making infrastructure? They'll build something like this. A five-layer application where it starts with a load balancer, balances out their services, goes to some database, and at the end, all, this, all it, re it really re uh, returns is a list of items and how they're being bid on. Right, and this is actually direct from the AWS white paper, like this is their recommended way of doing it, and tell me why a uh, high piece company is gonna be building out infrastructure for something this complex. And with PubNub, it's a matter of fact of just making a function sending the data, and then receiving it back. And, and we'll actually see how this looks. This is a pretty great GIF, but I'll show you how this, this code actually looks. So this is generally how you would do it. You build out a microservice, a bidding function, and based on when the bid comes in, you would execute a set of uh, commands, and then you would send back the bid. So, why even go through all this hassle? Like, if you build your own infrastructure, you own it, right? You can scale it yourself. Engineers are clearly very cocky, and they think they're better than everyone else. Uh, reality is, it's actually really cost effective, right? Instead of spending the time to build out your traditional infrastructure, you can spend time on building your product and launch it right away, knowing that it'll be able to scale. You pay per use, not for the time that you put in to build out this infrastructure like you usually would have. So let's talk about Quant Connect. Does anyone know about Quant Connect? Yeah. So it's an algorithmic trading platform and it allows you to build out your, your algorithm to be able to trade using that, um, the algorithm that you put in. So this is what they used before, the, the diagram of HTTP polling. It's much in use right now and they used it before until they, they saw the hurdles with it. Um, the problem with this, like I mentioned earlier, is you start to see a lot of issues scaling. So the main use case for Quant Connect is the ability to show real-time data. When you have something as crucial as like the stock market where a lot of money is involved and there's a lot of retail investors using this, pl this platform, it's important to get it right the first time. You don't want to mess up and show them the wrong candlestick or show it a bit too late because let's say in the Forex market where every second count and every pip counts, you don't want to have that delay. 
And with this, the more they scaled, they saw the problem where they weren't able to show that real-time data. And with services like PubNub, I'm not trying to sell PubNub, by the way. I'm just using PubNub because they gave me pretty gifts. But you can use other platforms as well and other cloud providers. But in reality, if you use something like PubNub and have the ability to stream that data real time, um, you just get better results and it's much cheaper in the long term. So how many of you have heard of trade for me Or binaryoptions.com? So the idea behind trade for me binary options is kind of the social media aspect of uh, trading. So it builds a community where other traders can share their platform and their uh, trading algorithms with other like newer traders. And it's really interesting because they didn't use PubNub for, let's say, like executing the trades, but they used it for the real-time analytics. And this is really important because in this specific relationship where there's a social aspect, you need to build trust. And to build trust, you need to have accurate data and up-to-date data, especially with trading. I'm trying to use specific FinTech use cases for you guys because I know a lot of you are financially motivated. Um, but this applies to any analytics space in general. So trade for me actually had this problem where they were trying to use the same method they tried to use this same method for long polling, and what ended up happening was they, they just couldn't scale. So they started hitting this point where they had about 1,000 users, and they're, they're at that point where they're transitioning from uh, being early on startup to, okay, we're starting to get real traction. And that's the worst thing to happen, like a server crash. Has anyone been in the room when there's a server crash? Yeah, it's, it's hectic. <laughs> you don't want that happening at all. Um, so it's a very simple solution for them, and it was to just connect with PubNub, send the data real time. All it is is four lines of code to actually publish and subscribe to data. All right, so I kind of went through all the fluff. <laughs> um, let's actually build out a service application. I don't expect you guys to pull out your laptops and start coding, but uh, I'll, I'll show you guys how it's actually done. If you guys want to test out a real service application, pull out your phones, just use the camera app, and scan the QR code. I'll give you some time. Feel free to pull it out. And if you see a white screen, don't worry about it. That's how it's supposed to be. All right, give it a few more seconds. OK, so show your phone to the person right beside you. Just like show it to the ne person next to you. If I just press a button, everyone's screen must have changed. Yeah, turn to blue. If I press the red button, it's all, oops, it's all red now. Yeah, so regardless of how many people are in this room, by the way, it doesn't really matter. I can just continue to do this, and regardless of the scale, we'll be able to do this, like real time. And by the way, I'll show you the code after. This is five lines of code. Like, I was able to make a, a, a serverless application for maybe, what, 50, 60, 70 people here and able to deliver the message in real time. And we'll look at more complex solutions, too. This is the easiest thing. This took me an hour to make. <laughs> so it's, it's fairly straightforward, and we'll look at the serverless applications in a sec. So remember that really complicated real-time bidding architecture? Imagine instead of colors, I sent you the bid. I sent you $5, $10, and I kept on updating the bid. With four lines of code, I was able to do what AWS engineers would probably take you know, a couple weeks to make in about one or two hours. right? So that's all it was. It was the ability to just publish and subscribe and send that data in real time. So this is actually what serverless is. This is, this is all the code. You, you set a publish key, a subscribe key, and then you send a JSON payload that will be delivered anywhere in the world in a quarter of a second. So I'm going to look at a, a bigger use case. And how many of you have dealt with OAuth before? OAuth 2.0? Yeah, so this is the OAuth flow. And just to go through it one more time, um, there, there's essentially six steps to it. First, your application has an authorization request. And your user then replies to the authorization grant. 
And that's usually if you have like a, let's say a Gmail account, if you guys have ever used Google sign in, that's the OAuth flow. And you do a bunch of different steps with your authorization server and the resource server. And this requires you to have some sort of back end to do it. But the reality is like a lot of developers are trying to move very quickly and make a lean application. Some of them don't even want to build out this, this, uh, this back end, right? Most of them are usually React developers or front end developers that want to just build an application. So how does this look if we made this without any back end? No Node.js, no Java, just plain JavaScript front end. And we created it with a serverless back end. So here, here's a demo of the app. Uh, have you guys heard of Smart Car before? Anyone? So Smart Car is this new startup in Silicon Valley, and what they do is they allow you to leverage all the hardware on these new cars and be able to do anything to it. So if I want to unlock the door, I can make an API request and unlock the door. And we've done it with Teslas, we've done it with um, BMWs. Uh, any car past 2011 can basically be leveraged here, and you can. Uh, get the odometer reading and a bunch of other things. So going through the authorization flow, I can check out which car I want. Uh, this is in test mode, so there's no real credentials, but if you had Audi, you would sign in through your Audi connection. So I just put an email address, put in any password, then give the request for which car I want to show on my dashboard, allow it. And now we can get the updated information. So this response, by the way, the lag is on the smart car API side. They're just giving a response. And here we can get the real-time location of where this car is. We can get the ID, the, the make, the model, the year. We can interact with the car, unlock the car in real time. And all this really took was about five lines of code on my front end and a couple serverless uh, microservices that were able to execute on this. So what's happening here, going back to the flow of the diagram, we have, we have the authorization and we have an access token. And then after that, we can make our request to the smart car API. The authorization request is just a simple HTTP request. It's a little service that I created where it takes in your ID from your application and then it makes the request for you. So there's no backend component to, to this app at all, aside from the microservices that I built out. And here I just send a request this one is just 10 lines of code. It responds with the token. And this is where I unlock the door. And this is all just a HTTP request. All it does is it sends the data that I got from their API and sends it back to execute something. And that's really it. It's uh, pretty straightforward to get started with microservices and, and, and serverless especially because you can put your microservices directly into these serverless uh, containers and be able to run them in real time. And it's a matter of just stopping and starting these different modules. Um, it's a bit more complex with AWS Lambda and uh, other functions because you need to have some experience with the uh, CLI par part of it. But other than that, it's fairly straightforward. And so if anyone's wondering, like, is serverless something new? Is it? Um, is this new technology that's pr prone to breaking? The reality is like AWS Lambda has been out for about five years now, four years. PubNub has been around for about almost a decade. So we've kind of been honing in on ways to make this scalable and not break. Um, and really like it's, it's some trusted software and a lot of new companies are building on it right now. Over 2,000 companies including Gojek and a bunch of others you guys probably know uh, that are using our platform for some key things. So. Uh, now I'm just going to open it up for questions. I left some time for you guys. Um, if you guys want to ask me, I want want to make this really hands-on. Any questions? Uh, any any questions for Jeff? I just want to ask, what uh, what technology is behind the PubNab? What messaging broker do you use? Yeah. So. <clears throat> The way that my engineer broke this down for me is <laughs> it's essentially a really, really good web server. And what we've done is we built it ground up from C, and then we've architected front to end the best way to have this messaging system work. So the way that we term it is it's a data streaming network that we've built, and we have patents on it. We have over, I think, 20 patents on the way that we build out our architecture. And that's kind of our secret sauce, our gravy. 
the way that we built our web server and then also the architecture behind it. Any other questions? Any, any other questions for Sayed? Okay, well, thanks very much, Sayed. <laughs> it, um, I, I guess we've, we've all learned a little bit more each, each session we've had today about the path to, to microservices and how, how you can um, optimize that. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, please, please thank Syed for a um, great presentation. <laughs>